good afternoon uh, to you all and thanks so much for your patience. Uh, I must first of all uh, thank the organizers, the Chamber of Agribusiness of which I'm part. Um, I also thank the earlier three speakers who have actually made my work very difficult, uh, very, very easy actually. Um, I'm actually wondering if there's anything to add to all that has been said already. But um, since I have the platform, I'll just take the opportunity to share some thoughts with you. Now, um, the thing about the agribusiness in itself, as uh, professor, uh, professor, professor made mention of, is that um, there's a lot of opportunity within the agribusiness sector. There is also a number of challenges that some people may want to talk about. Um, there is uh, a lot of the time we get ourselves into certain activities and we keep wondering whether or not that is the best um, area for us. Now, after we have been able to identify all of these, how do we position ourselves in such a way that we can take ad advantage of some of these opportunities that are coming up? How do we uh, differentiate ourselves? How do we put ourselves in there in the market to be able to trade effectively with other organizations uh, globally? So this afternoon, I'm just going to share with you um, a model that I developed, which I refer to as a COVID-19 continuum. I'll just share some food facts, uh, look at some uh, considerations that one would want to uh, have when you are putting in place strategies to be able to come out successfully after the COVID-19. And then I uh, would look at various forms of strategizing. But one thing I must say is that any organization that hitherto had no um, strategies would find it very difficult to be able to recover, mainly because irrespective of the fact that some of the strategies may have been thrown or put into some form of imbalance, what is happening now is that if you do not have anything that you would have formed the basis of your modus operandi, Moving forward is going to be a challenge because you don't have a baseline or a platform or a foundation on which you're going to build your strategy for the next phase post-COVID. So this is the COVID-19 continuum. And what it does is that it helps me understand and appreciate what COVID-19 has brought to us and what we and how we have actually moved, how we have actually moved on to be able to determine that, hey, uh, this is a stage at which we have reached. Now, before COVID, uh, we were living in a situation whereby we always, we actually thought we we're doing things the right way until the COVID event occurred. And then it shook the very foundation of our various organizational strategies and um, uh, initiatives. Then we had early infections where we probably did have, we had very little information because very little information was coming from China, the World Health Organization had almost no information in regards to uh, what COVID was, how it was being, um, uh, the, the mode of transfer, um, how people, how many people were getting, uh, how people were getting it, which areas were actually the epicenters. And we've realized over time that the epicenters have, have moved from Wuhan to uh, Europe to the Americas. And then fortunately for us in Africa, we are not um, necessarily going through any mainstream of such um, uh, vast numbers of um, infections, but looking at what is happening today in Ghana, uh, I dare say that if we are not careful and we do not manage the way we are going about the handling of the COVID-19 cases, then we might end up just uh, going overboard beyond what we initially thought. Um, I'm sharing some food facts and here we get to know that over the period, uh, food for service loss globally, as uh, indicated by the Food and Agricultural Organization, goes over 30%. And this is a uh, global average. In Ghana, that goes to a little over 40%. And that's mainly because we, when you look at the various value chains, most of them are not that well developed. And that is where some of us can actually take advantage when we are doing putting in place in the initial uh, business initiatives, as well as uh, the focus markets and in the segments of the market that we want to be able to serve. Now, I would also want to realize that 75% of the poor are in the rural areas. And the interesting thing about that, or the converse thing about that, is that out of the 75% who are in the rural areas, we also know that agric 
in the rural areas mm -hmm. would employ not less than 80% of the locals. And then when you look at Ghana as a whole, over 60% of our population are employed in agri. And that's why it is, um, I found it very, very interesting that uh, with, based on the information that Professor Bokpin shared with us, looking at the multiplier effects and then looking at how much value we are able to get back. Now, in terms of value, one of the things that we need to be able to understand is that value is determined by the customer. Um, every organization gets into business for a reason. And for whatever reason you'd want to get into business, one of the things that is key in being able to determine what strategies you put out is that every strategy that you, you start defining or every idea that you have that you have to work out to be able to get to satisfy the customer must be based on the needs of the customer. So here you're looking at the, the requirements. If, for instance, I prefer yam chips, um, how do I want to have my yam chips? Would I want to have it um, frozen? Would I want to have it uh, cooked? Would I want to have it ready? So depending on whatever we, you'd want to uh, go into, um, value in itself may vary from uh, customer to customer. Now, the other thing also that I want us to look at here is mainly the issues of the industry. In my personal view and from my personal experience, I think market linkage is one of the most um, difficult things that a lot of people within the agribusiness space face. And my reason is that when you take right from the smallholder farmer, production is not a problem because he produce based on uh, how well he's able to dispose whatever is left. He would go back to subsistence if he realizes that whatever he produces goes bad. And that is why we have post harvest losses. So a lot of us who are into, uh, who are actually into the production phase or, or part of agribusiness do not produce to meet a particular market. We produce with the hope or with the belief that somebody would come by. And if that doesn't happen, we declare ourselves as having uh, ventured into an industry or a sector that is not worth it. By natural fact, we really didn't uh, prepare ourselves for that. The other thing also that I realized from experience is that the soil quality over time uh, is deteriorating. And that is across board. And that is why a lot of us have started using chemicals, which are not helping us. Because uh, based on a situation I, I, I actually witnessed in the northern, sorry, now OT region, a woman went to um, the, an input dealer and wanted to buy chemicals. She was told that uh, she actually bought the chemicals, went to use it and came back to make a complaint. And the complaint she was lodging is that she used the chemicals and it so happens that unfortunately the, her groundnuts, three acres of groundnuts were standing brown. When I inquired further, I got to know that she actually used the chemicals based on the fact that she believed that it was uh, selective. And this was because a friend of hers who used it for maize recommended that it was working very well. So you realize that a lot of us are using chemicals, uh, be it fertilizers, be it, and uh, with, when it comes to fertilizers, a lot of it is the NPK 15, 15, 15, and at some point you add ammonia and all of that. But the question is, what is happening to the soil? The soil is depleting in quality. We also have a lot of um, our, the, the cropping systems being, let's say, if you're planting yam, you plant yam for the next 15, 20 years, and you're still using it for yam. If you're using it for granules, we do, uh, you're using, you continue planting it for all that time. But there's, that's mixed farming uh, concept or mixed cropping is gradually phasing out. Now, in terms of our farming system, we're still using the cutlass and bull. Um, there's some form of uh, uh, mechanization ongoing, but it will also interest you to note that with the mechanization, you'd go onto the field and realize that a lot of the uh, tractors and all are not operational because we don't have the skill to, in those communities, they don't have the skill to be able to um, repair them. So what exactly or how was the rollout being done? The penetration of technology is another area that, uh, that is of interest to me, and that's mainly because we, uh, yes, technology is good. And as a matter of fact, COVID-19 has actually served as a catalyst to the implementation of technology. Because hitherto, and uh, hitherto, a lot of us, yes, knew about having meetings online, but we wouldn't want to adopt it because we preferred meeting face-to-face. -face. 
But the key thing now is that technology in itself could be detrimental if you do not know how to use it. And those in the, our smallholder farmers, majority of whom do not know how to use the smartphones, would need a lot of support. The kind of technology that we use on the, within the agricultural space also, as you, can, as you, you may have realized, there's a lot of uh, tech-related um, entrepreneurship uh, programs where they're able to get funding. But the question is, when you're able to develop that, who are you sending it to? And how well would they be able to use it? And that's another thing. And I must commend Isoko for how the, having been consistent over the time with being able to provide market prices amongst others. And the other part of it has got to do with infrastructure. And um, with infrastructure, it's difficult for a lot of us because, like was mentioned by other speakers, it's a challenge. And we don't have, for instance, cold storage. Our agri supply chain system is almost non-existent for a lot of the value chains. And as a result of that, uh, you get into the various communities and you realize that we were still using the old method of, for instance, storing maize, old methods of storing uh, yam. But in all of this, uh, as uh, have been mentioned as uh, industry challenges, there, is, there lies the opportunity. And for anybody who is yet to venture into, into the agribusness space, I'd, I'd recommend that you look into some of these areas because as a matter of fact, there's, uh, I always say that if you want to copy, you could copy with pride, because, but just make it better for yourself. A lot of these things have been solved in other areas and in other jurisdictions like Southeast Asia, um, where notably in uh, India, for instance, I love to speak about the Amul Cooperative, where they go, they provide collection centers for milk, which are then sent into uh, a processing units. They produce milk, ghee, amongst others, and they are consuming it locally. So these are some of the things I would need to take into serious consideration if we are going to be able to take advantage of it. Now, delving straight into why, uh, the, the, how we put together our strategies. Unfortunately, in this presentation, I'm not going to be able to be very specific with very particular industries, mainly because the, we are not talking about a particular value chain. We're looking at it in general terms. But one of the things, one of the main words that has uh, kept me going over the period is a wise man's writing, which tells me that I should put my vision and make it plain up on table so that he that sees it can run with it. So if there's anybody who is an uh, entrepreneur or who is into agribusiness, definitely you'd have come into agribusiness for a reason. Whatever vision you have as an for your organization must be made known to your staff. In a, a consultancy, in some consulting work that I do, I realize that a lot of organizations, yes, have visions, yes, they have missions, but their staff don't live by those missions and visions. Why? Because they don't know about it. And that happens a lot in SMEs. And as a matter of fact, the organizations I'm referring to are actually, many of them are multinationals. And, it is so, and as a result of that, staff or people who you work with or who we work with, don't really appreciate what exactly we are doing. They don't know how their actions and inactions affect the organization's uh, productivity and as a result of its pro uh, profitability. So it is important that whatsoever vision you have for your organization as a startup, as an SME, as an organization that has, is in its growth stage, it is important that you enable your, the staff of the organization to appreciate what you are doing so that they can run with it. Otherwise, in every, at every point in time, you'll be frustrated. And you'll be frustrated not because you do not have a very good vision, but because you don't get the buy-in of the staff who you're working with as a part of it. Now, to be able to strategize, it is important that um, you initially break bulk. And what, what I mean by breaking bulk is that the agri agricultural, agricultural industry is very huge. Um, you would have to define or determine which of the which aspect of the value chains and which first of all which value chain you're going to be in and which the role you're going to play within the value chain. So let's take livestock breeding for instance. When we uh, at uh, Agriculture and More started our agri our livestock farm, uh, Misha farms in the uh, Guantanamo district, uh, we started with pigwood and uh, we have uh, some goats and some cattle as well, but we are, we are still in a growth phase. 
Now, what happened was that at that point in time, we hadn't decided whether or not we were going to go the whole ride from breeding to, to table, or we hadn't determined whether we were just going to fatten and sell. We didn't de hadn't determined whether we were just we were going to buy off people and then later um, uh, process or add value to it. So as a matter of fact, whilst we were working on it, we didn't perform that well. And that's not made, not not the reason why it didn't succeed on the first try is not just based on the fact that we probably did not break bulk, but there were other factors as well. But what I want to, or what I'm just trying to draw your attention to is that it is important that you are able to determine which aspect or what you're going into. So if you are an agribusiness and you're going into, let's say, uh, soya production, are you going to be do the farming? Are you going to do the value addition of the processing? Are you going to do the marketing of it? Or what exactly are you going to do? And that is very key. Now, the other part of it also is that once you're able to break bulk, when you're able to take a particular value chain and you're able to determine who or what the various uh, activities within the value chain are, then it enables you to be able to identify or analyze the various activities and determine which of them you'd want to um, explore for yourself. Now, once you are able to determine where you want to explore, you now define your market. And your market would determine what offerings would you would not now need to give them. Because if you do not know the market you are going to sell to, you would be producing just like the smallholder farmers do right now. But the key thing about a lot of us who have the opportunity of being on this is the education that we have and the exposure as well. And like I mentioned earlier on, market linkaging is, is, very, uh, is one of the key areas that a lot of us have a challenge in. So if anybody is going to go into agribusiness right now, one of the things that one would want to look at is probably the value addition aspect of it. Because if we have as much as 40% of our agri-produce going waste, and we are still investing a lot more in production, 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 then in that case, we are still going to have a lot more going waste, which hitherto we would have been able to add value to. That is not to say production is not good, because as a matter of fact, our production systems or what we use, uh, our inputs into production, are another area that we need to we'll take a look at in the, uh, as we go further. So what the, the image that I have sh uh, shared with you there just tell, just tries to give a, a pictorial view of the various food systems where, that we have. So if it's an issue of waste management, what, how are you managing the waste? So an example is this. If, how many of us have looked into the various value chains? So for instance, if, there, if you have an abattoir and the abattoir is, is, does about 20, 30 slaughters, what are, what are some of the ways by which, for instance, one, you can use the blood? Because I know that the bones can also be used. And these are things that a lot of us most of the time do not look into. Because in Ghana, one of the things that I have come to realize over time is that we love to do the copying. We copy with pride, but we don't personalize it. So for instance, you realize that somebody has started um, going into the uh, production of plantain chips. Everybody now wants to go into plantain chips. Why? Because they, they believe the the plantain chips are too creative. But one of the things that we fail to realize is that when we all get into it, we are crowding the market. And I, that's the same thing with almost everything, if you observe everything that we do, and that is one of the key challenges that we are having now. So it is important that we're able to define the areas that we are going to operate in and stay focused there. But key with strategy is that if you're going to be able, if you're going to be successful, it depends on your mindset. If you're not going to be successful, it also depends on your mindset. So if you have a positive mindset that keeps you going, once you are able to define your target market and you're able to determine how or the direction you're going based on your vision, then it makes it a lot easier for you to be able to um, uh, forge ahead. Now, one of the things that I, uh, words I also take inspiration from is a quote that I want to share with you. And it says, invest in seven ventures, yes, eight ventures. You do not know what, what disaster may come upon the land. But the key thing about this is that it, I am not by this suggesting that you should go in so many investments at a particular point in time. Because if you are not careful, you'll be spreading yourself very thinly. Yes, I agree that a lot of people get into agriculture having a lot of money, like um, in the field that I, what we do right now. Another thing that agriculture and more does is that we produce the 
Dream Meals uh, brand of frozen yam chips. This is something that we started about four years ago, and we've been doing a lot of work to be able to um, improve the product. But you realize that whilst we were in the system, you realize that you have certain people who have financial muscle and they come in to, to almost like um, dwarf you. But if you know very well the strategy you are working with and you know your client base, who your target market is, then in that case, at least you know that there are certain fights that you cannot fight, but you can at least stay focused and keep on pushing on. And definitely you'll get your share of the market. So one of the ways by which I encourage us to be able to put together our strategies is that let's consider ways of integration. There are ways by which, so for instance, you, you go to, um, when you look at the agricultural value chains, we, for instance, based on the yam chips that we produce, we have had to backwards, we actually backwards integrated because we also produce the yam ourselves. Now, in producing the yam, we're able to maintain a certain level of sustained supply of our yams. And also, we're able to determine the quality and quantity of the yam over time. So in the event that we need anybody to be able to supply us, we know where and how to go. And that's why we have um, worked, started working on our outgrower system. So for some organizations, at this point in time of COVID-19, you might probably need to probably forward integrate, maybe backwards integrate, so that you are better able to, com uh, uh, to control the, your, your supply chain. And that is very key. Another way to strategize is to diversify. So for instance, you're producing, we are currently producing uh, yam chips, but because of the process that we have, we are able to use it to produce other, way, other products without having to um, invest in um, equipments amongst others. It's just like what the sanitizer, the breweries did when they realized that they, they were using the ethanol for the production of uh, their alcoholic beverages. And then they now, had the opportunity of uh, producing sanitizers, they just switched into it. Yes, it will come at a certain cost, probably at a certain inconvenience. But at the end of the day, they were able to uh, move into those areas to take advantage of the market. And if my memory serves me right, the FDA says that as of today, sorry, as at the time they had that interview I watched, they had not less than 900 organizations or companies that were now producing sanitizers. So that also means that in diversification, it brings us opportunities as well. One of the key things that I have realized that in Ghana, we seldom do is to collaborate. And I say that because when there are certain trainings that I have had to, uh, to attend, that were for me an opportunity to be able to meet people and then have interactions. But you get to the training site and they tell you that, oh, apparently some, the people did not want to have the training in bulk. They wanted, they preferred having it individually. We have individual preferences, but one of the things that collaboration does is that it enables all of us to be able to have a piece of the cake than all of us losing out on the entire cake. So, and that is why organizations such as the Chamber of Agribusiness is key, because supposing there is a need, we are able to pool resources together and then serve the need. But in a situation whereby I, am, I stand alone, it becomes a challenge. One other area that we could uh, strategize to take advantage of is pricing. A lot of the time we are forced, we seem to believe that, we are made to believe that when you're getting into a market, your price, you should price low so that you can take advantage of the market. But that's not always the case because if you're not careful, you will be priced low and priced out. So you in, in being once you have been able to break ball, you identify where you're, where you're, you're, you're kind of the kind of clients or customers you're serving, you should be able to drill down and determine what their purchasing price or, the, or what their purchasing power is like. So an example, what we did when we were working on uh, the uh, yam chips is that we actually had to drill down to our the category, the main category, go further down into the segment of of our market. So even though we have about eight or so other companies who have come into the scene with yam chips, a lot of the time I tell my people I miss that I am yes, they, they are competitors, yes. And that's mainly because I don't know how much or how well they may have invested in certain aspects. You know, for instance, developing the product. 
because I know that for over the past four years, until last year, we hadn't kind of fine-tuned the product. So people who, because, and the, the reason why the product is important is that if your product, if someone tastes our Dream Meals Yam Chips today, and he tastes Dream Meals Yam Chips tomorrow, he should be able to have the value that he, he is going in for. And that is, in my view, one of the reasons why Papaya, for instance, has been able to be, uh, has, uh, is a market leader in their market, mainly because they've been able to sustain the taste. So if you go to Papaya today, you know that if you're buying the grilled chicken, it is grilled chicken, and this is how it has been. In the past, we have Steers, we have Mr. Biggs, we have other uh, um, uh, organizations come into the market. But what happened? They were not able to stay through, through to the end. You know, so this, these are some of the things I would need to take a look at. And in terms of differentiation, there are quite a different ways by which, many, many ways by which we can differentiate our products, be it our product offerings or by way of our service offerings. And that is one of the things that, and that's why, for instance, I said earlier on that copying is, is good. I love copying, but I, and I copy with pride as a matter of fact. But when you're copying, don't copy like in an exam where you copy including the person's name and index number. Go through it, take the, the portions of it that work for you and implement them. Don't go take it wholly and implement them because the various parameters, the various market segments, the, the financial muscle that the person may have would vary from what you have. And as a result of that, your implementation may be unsuccessful. And for me, that's one of the things that I believe has made a lot of people believe that agribusiness in itself is not, a val uh, is not a viable or it's very risky. And the main reason is that it, it's, it, I don't know which sector of the, or which business is not risky. But the key thing is that a lot of the time we believe that agribusiness or agriculture in itself does not require that much uh, science. But that is a fallacy. Because right from the soil type, the kind of uh, cropping materials or the planting materials or seeds, the um, uh, how the kind the quantity of fertilizer, the weedy sites that we use, the when to uh, the withdrawal period for our, our chemicals, when to uh, the kind of antibiotics used for our livestock, when not to inject them anymore, when the kind of treatments, the biosafety measures that are required. All of these things are science. But the thing about science these days is that science looks as though it is so far away from us. And that is why it is important that in being able to transfer or trans, pardon me, sorry, to translate that science into something that is usable or workable for those of us who may not necessarily have a science background. And that is where our research institutions come in. Because I can tell you that there's, and with an authority, that there are tons and tons and tons and tons of research based on agriculture that well, are not being used, especially when it's got to do with the food area. But the other challenge is that we have a lot of areas. So for instance, there's a Share Institute, which is in the US. In the US. We have Coco Research Institutes of Ghana, but if I ask how many of us have been able to uh, go there to seek more information on how to use or va add value to cocoa, majority of us haven't done it. You know, and that's one of the things that we in Ghana have, I have a challenge because currently, even though we have over 60% of us in uh, being employed by agri directly or indirectly, what is happening is that the value that is coming out of agri is not commensurate to the number of people who are working in the industry. That means that, that also tells us that there is a lot of opportunity, but you have to be able to position yourself in a way to be able to take advantage of it. One of the things I'd like to mention at this point before I, in, in, uh, before I conclude is that we have, over the past couple of uh, months, if not years, been working on the continental free trade area, the African continental free trade area. But one area of caution that I want to let us as agribusiness know is that it is not automatic to get the benefits of after if we do not invest in agriculture. Because one of the things I have come to learn is that in South Africa, for instance, not many people then know that you can actually take cocoa in a cold form. 
a lot of them in South Africa, a lot of them take it as a hot beverage, but not as the cold, cold beverage. So many people may not necessarily have known. How are we going to be able to translate whatever we have locally to be able to use it uh, mm-hmm. on, on the African stage? A lot of countries also, for instance, in Kenya, there was a post on Facebook some time ago that I put about how yams were going waste. And someone says that, hey, why not just put, make, it, make it into flour? But the question is, yes, a lot of us claim that there, the way, there, there's opportunity, but we are not willing to go the extra mile to get Dell further into it to determine what the opportunities are. And key for us as Africans and generally in, in Ghana is that we have to find a way by which we can add value to our produce so that we can take advantage of the gains that come by way of um, that come by way of uh, foreign exchange. I, for me, I think it's a no-brainer. And um, for us, when we keep talking about the currency um, devaluation, currency fluctuations, and all that, because in simple terms, if you are exporting more, you get more foreign currency, and it works better for you. If you are importing more, then in that case, your local currency is strained. And as a result of that, you now require more of the local currency to buy the, 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 the foreign goods. And one of the things that the, okay. happens uh, when you continue to do it is that... Uh, just, just give me a minute. A minute, I'll just, I'm just running out. What that, does, what, what, that does, what that does is that when you are importing, you are providing employment, gainful employment for people from the countries of export. So let us take advantage of what we have in Ghana. And I believe that together we can make Ghana great again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Nalaban. That was very insightful. And that was for this. Um, we would like to invite Q&A at this time. This is our last Q&A for the day. So if you have a question, please unmute your microphone and ask the question so that the speakers can respond to your questions. And I will also please that you make the question very specific to the speakers. If it's Mr. Nelson asking, I'll make it specific. If it's Mr. Miller asking, also make the question specific to him so that we'll be able to respond to this. So the floor is open for questions. Uh, hello, Mr. Moderator. Hello, can I come in? Yes, please come in. Look, I, my name is Techi. Uh, I'm actually joining you from Spain, and I'm the CEO of Euro Machinery Network in Ghana. Look, um, we've been into uh, this agribusiness uh, by supplying agriculture equipment from Spain, okay? in Ghana, and I have been working closely with uh, the CEO of uh, uh, Farm Masters, who is also the CEO of the, the Chamber. Uh, what I would say is that uh, most of the speakers made mention of very, very interesting point during this uh, COVID period. And uh, I, I'm really grateful for these opinions they have shared uh, during this platform. Uh, in Ghana, actually, for example, the, he made mention of Uber. Uh, what we are doing uh, during this period is that uh, we are trying to work with local transport companies like VIP, Metro Mass, uh, to jo- uh, send our products, like, for example, brush cutters, tillers, and the rest, of which uh, is basically functioning very well. And some of them, for example, from Sunyani, where we have our base, we are able to link up in all parts of Ghana through these transport companies. Another point is that um, this, this uh, speaker before the last uh, speaker made mention of uh, trying to link up with uh, companies to supply equipment. Um, we, we are willing uh, to help in this regard. So. Uh, what I would say is that um, I, I might leave my uh, information with the chamber so that uh, whilst we are here and still working, because I've been working 
as an international business developer for companies here in Spain, where uh, these light equipment and heavy equipment for construction are being made. And uh, in comparison with, with uh, the prices from China, I think we are uh, getting very good product from here. And uh, this product can really help people in Ghana. And I think uh, it's, a, it's a good opportunity for people to know that uh, although uh, they may be asking for product from China, they can also take the advantage of assessing products from Europe where uh, prices are relatively competitive, where they have spare parts, which is very important, and also people to help them service these products through our company. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a question here. I uh, think, um, how, how do you secure land as a fresh graduate to start a farm? Any grant for such people like oh, no. Okay, so the question is, how does one secure land as a fresh graduate to start a project? Um, so, do we answer now, or we'll take a couple? Okay. Uh, okay, so please unmute your mic if you have questions. Ask them so that we can have them attended to. Yeah, I, I, I have a question, eh? Okay. Please yeah, mine is, mine is about networking, which all the great speakers, including our great professor, Dumping, I alluded to. Uh, now, after this, is it possible for us to have a WhatsApp or a Telegram program, which would then enable you to take time and then deliver our, you know, deliver our questions and other things so that so I'm looking at about the marketing and even how to go about the business. So first of all, the organizers, the, can we have a network, a, a platform, whether uh, WhatsApp or uh, Telegram? Please, come to the point, please. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Jam. By the way, my name is Ambrose. My name is Ambrose. I'm the CEO of Devil Farms. We process uh, meat and also red pigs. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, that is good to emphasize. Yes, we have that plan. Uh, let me say that the Chamber already have existing social media platform on, on, on WhatsApp and Telegram, but we are we have a special platform for this program for those of you who are looking forward for partnership and collaboration. And so once we have your details, uh, you'll be added to this platform. And those of you who registered by email, you'll be, you'll be given details as to how to join the platforms after the sections. Okay. Uh, we'd like to take more questions. Those of you who have questions, please unmute your microphone and ask the questions. Yeah, hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Please go ahead. Um, Yes, once again, my name is Stephen Iwa. I represent Farelli and Michelle, Global Agribusiness Consultants. Um, we are specialists in connecting investors to agribusinesses in sub saharan Africa. So um, anybody who is interested uh, can connect uh, with me later on. Right. The issue I want to contribute to is the issue about networking. Um, when you go to Europe, you go to the Americas, you see a lot of businesses that started as networking, you know, through networking. You see two friends coming together to build an idea into a business and in no time it becomes a giant successful business. And it's, it's a situation all over the place, if you agree with me. But then when you come to this part of our country, of, of, of the continent, you know, especially Ghana, uh, networking has not been very successful. And for me, um, what I see is the challenge of us as individuals and as business people sometimes not being very uh, diligent, very um, open, very transparent in our dealings with our partners. And it's a situation everywhere. Sometimes you're running a project, uh, you need the support of uh, a partner. Uh, possibly you want to, maybe want to engage some services on credit, 
I'm hoping that at the end of the day, you'll be able to uh, uh, pay or, you know, uh, meet the obligations that you have. Your friend will come in with a good heart. Oh, let me help you to accomplish what you want to do. At the end of the day, there's always disappointment. So I feel that sometimes we need to spend a, a lot of time to kind of uh, speak about the, the soft characteristics and then the soft, the soft you know, capabilities of business development and factors for our business success. So that we could come to the understanding that networking is a great tool that as businesses and as agribusinesses, we need to take advantage of. We, we really want to transform agriculture in Africa and in Ghana in particular. Networking is a great tool, but then as individuals, let us be very open, let us be transparent. When we're going into partnerships, let's go in with our whole heart and trust, you know, and openness. So that at least we would be able to always build very substantial and efficient businesses to thrive and, and, and stand the test of time, uh, just like what happens uh, in Europe and other places. So that is a contribution I want to make. Thank you very much, Mr. Ria. Um, I think yes, you hit it right on the, on the head. Uh, networking is work, and so you just don't contact somebody and expect things to work out. You have to be deliberate and intentional about it. Yeah, we'll take it up from here. Um, we would like to take further question, uh, more questions. If you have questions, unmute yes. your mic and ask the question. Yes. Hi. 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 This is Kwame Bequin. Um, I'm basically representing Grow For Me, which is an agricultural fintech company. And, you know, just going through what was just mentioned, actually, on, on networking, um, I, point, I took out something that um, Fertis Miller mentioned on collaboratives and the fact that these seem to work more efficiently in East Africa, in Kenya, than they do in Ghana. So I wanted to hear from um, uh, Mr. Miller as regards to what we can do in Ghana or here in West Africa to really leverage that, you know, it's on the same theme of networking and working as collaborative. So I wanted to hear more advice on what we could do on that regards, please. Okay, so that is a question to Mr. Miller. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Hello. 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 Should I, should I answer now or wait till all of the questions? Yes, let's take him off, then we can address Hello? them. Okay, yeah. Uh, go ahead. Hello? Hello? You. Good afternoon. Good job. Uh, I'm Vincent. I have a head. Vincent, please. Can you reposition yourself? Africa. Hello? Okay, next lesson, please. Yeah, hello. Yes, please go ahead. Hello. We can hear you. Yeah, me too. Hello. 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 You can please go ahead with your question. Hello. Uh, okay. Um, hello. Let's meet. You. Hello. Take the questions. Uh, Hello. Good afternoon. Hello. We can hear you. Can you ask your question? Okay. Um, Reverend George Donko. I just joined uh, the program. I'm I'm new on it. Um, uh, it was a friend, uh, Reverend Emmanuel, introduced me to just today and I'm very much interested and uh, I have intention of entering into a farming with some products for export. So I want to know the assistance that this organization can give and also how to join this, your organization. Okay. That's okay, my thank question. You. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Uh, please check the chat box. Um, we put the WhatsApp number for the chamber. We also added an email address. We've also added the chamber's website as well so that you can register to us and we'll take it up after this section. 
Any other question? If you have a question, yes, hello. hello. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, that's Vincent. That's Mr. Vincent. You can be heard. Please go ahead with your question. All right, all right. I'm, a, I'm just a new farmer, and then I'm inquiring from the agri chamber whether they have any support for the young farmers. For now, I myself, I just completed screening. I want to enter into farming system. So I've started with animal farming, which is pace. And as it stands now, where I am now, I need to extend it. So I don't know whether they have uh, support to support us so that we can enjoy the business as well. Ready? Okay. Okay, let me clarify this. Uh, the Chamber of Agribusiness doesn't in itself provide a direct support. Okay. What, what we do is that we create the linkage, we create the platform for you to network and be able to uh, uh, leverage on that opportunity to, to engage in partnership and collaborations. And also be able to you get in contact with investors if you need investors. So I'll plead with you, uh, check on the chat, Check, uh, check on the chat plat uh, the chat column and uh, reach out to us on our WhatsApp platform. And also, you can send us an email or you can visit our website and get in touch. I'll take it up from there. I'm Jamal, Sisi. Jamal, please go ahead. Yeah, my, my issue here is that I'm an ad grower uh, skin person that we support most of the farmers. But our challenge down here is that in Afawis, from Afawis, what you learn down here is that mostly we have, like the last speaker uh, I just spoke about, mostly we have challenge with market. And the last time I tried talking to Shantoni, that if there's a way that we can, the chamber can come together so that we can partner to harness or to put the various and uh, more other farmers produce together, so that they can get an optical for us, so that we can trade better. Well, uh, actually, we are, we've been suffering. We've been struggling in a in way to get a market for ourselves. And we are into soya beans and their maize. And that's what the soya is moving, but the maize that we have a feeling that we want to see how best we can help it so that we can come together, put this together, and then we can get the market with the chamber. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, like I said to the previous uh, uh, requests, previous persons who made a request, um, look through the chat and reach out to us on our WhatsApp line on our website or using our email address, and we'll take it up from there. If there are no any more questions, I would like to invite the speakers um, to respond to the question. I think uh, the first question had to do with... Uh, I have yet uh, to the speaker. Yeah, the last speaker said they, they have... Uh, they, it's, oh. and they have so, yeah. so the, the network, let's have that platform. I need me to buy CEO's All right. Hello? Okay, thanks. Yeah, so if you can link up with, with him, I, my information, I need the maize to buy to feed my animals. All right, thanks. All right, we'll, we'll get back to you. I barely heard what you said. I already, I already heard you need maize to feed your animals. Uh, so, Mr. Miller, please, can you respond to the question that was directed to you? Uh, yeah, uh, the question around cooperatives and, um, and, and how to build and set up cooperatives which is a function of networking and, and coming together. Look, I can't express it enough that really agriculture is about the culture of, of coming together to create, put food on the table. So I have to be very clear with you. The, the, the backbone, what keeps it going, is really the cooperative governance system that gives people confidence to know that the money, however small, that's club together is going to be managed properly. So uh, the cooperative governance systems, if it, if it comes down to people having uh, this type of, to understand what they're, if this is what people need to really see how this can work effectively, then by golly, we need to really into a relationship of, of, of building the parameters for that cooperative governance system for Ghana as it relates to your organization. If it's a faith-based organization, fantastic, we can do that. So, um, and I say that because they usually have numbers, sometimes in the thousands and things like that. And if people are clubbing together, even if 500 or 800 people are clubbing together to contribute a particular amount every month, I think people will begin to see 
over time. Uh, and it has the right checks and balances, the right accounting, accountability, and all aspects for everything that is bought and for technically how it is used. I think it, people will see the beneficial nature of uh, importance of this and what it really matters to that particular grouping. Now, how to set it up? Um, I think it would be probably a great idea. Um, I mean, I can provide this to the chamber. The chamber can disseminate this information, um, whatever it takes. But uh, I'm bullish on these types of structures because uh, they work and they have a history. And if people follow in, and there's regular reporting, people don't feel uh, slighted. Um, and and, it's, and it's, a dem it's a democratically voted upon initiative to build a particular model for delivering. Either it's on the value addition or it could be on the primary pr production side, can work very effectively. Many churches and, 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 and even mosques have land and things like that that you can uh, do raise wonderful beds and the rest of it. So these um, cooperative models, as I mentioned, I can disseminate the system, the cooperative governance structure for how that could work to the chamber. And that could be a methodology in which can be deployed. And uh, it's good to have oversight from outside in those organizations as well, because they can provide and glean uh, some measure of intelligence to help things should things go awry and to keep them uh, going according to a plan. And there are many cooperatives online that have information that can provide you with the insights necessary for understanding how to build that system. Banking institutions are created around this as well. So it's, it's not foreign, it's not something uh, obtuse or something that people are, are not, uh, not uh, familiar with, it can be done. So I, I hope that answers your question. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I really, I just want to tell you though, for this forum, for the Agribusiness Chamber, I really appreciate it. And I think you need to have a bit more of them. And hopefully GIZ would be accommodating in that respect with you, because I think there's a lot to be gleaned from this in terms of spreading knowledge around um, the principles for establishing and building an operation, be it small or, or, or be it a medium operation or, or to interject in certain areas of the supply chain where there's a need. And we know it's been disrupted uh, from delivering goods, uh, from moving milk, cooling chamber, you name it. So uh, once again, thank you very much. I hope that answers your question. And uh, if anybody else has any other questions, great. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Miller. Mr. Nalban, can you take two questions yes. that were directed? Yes, um, and uh, my apologies, I'll be very brief because of time. If any of you want to ask to engage further, you can get in touch with us at the chamber and we'll be happy to uh, provide you support. And the very first one had to do with securing land. Now, um, as a young graduate, you don't have the funds. You, you, you don't even, with regards to what to set up with, it's not available. So uh, my personal advice and what I did was I went back to my village, my hometown, and that's where I got some land. Usually, you just have to probably buy a schnapp or buy some drinks for them to perform some, or whatever they call it, and then you can have access to land. The other thing also is that if you want to go into a, a la much larger scale, get an outgrower system where the farmers themselves bring their land, and then you can take advantage of the crops, and then you can add value. So you don't necessarily need to go into the production. You can actually enter the, uh, the value chain at a different part of it by probably adding, adding value or aggregating it. And if you're very good at marketing to Vola, there's a huge opportunity be, uh, with regards to market linkages. So that's one, uh, uh, that's a response I'll give with regards to securing land. Don't necessarily want to own things. That's one of the things that we have as a people. Every time mm -hmm. we want to be able to refer to it as ours, but we forget that it takes time to be able to build a business. The Nestle's, the PZs, all that we see today, the Heinz, uh, the Hershey's, they didn't just grow in a day or two. It took time. And you can yeah. see some of them celebrating 100 years, 50 years, uh, 70 years. How many Ghanaian companies are over 50 at the moment that we can proudly beat our chest about? Uh -huh. So let's uh -huh. take a look. So in regards to the networking and partnerships, um, the chamber provides a platform. So it, it's, it's now behoves on the individual or the organization to engage on the platform to be able to build those networks for possible collaboration with other organizations. Now, one of the things that I realized personally from my engagements with some legal people was that 
the laws in Ghana do not uh, encourage partnerships. So because of that, I was actually advised at the time that it would be better to recruit somebody to do the work you pay him off, mainly because of some of the legal tussles that have gone on in the past. But things are changing, and I believe that some of these laws would, as time goes on, um, would be amended and or probably are improved to, for our benefits and encourage partnerships. But one of the key things that I find as a, a key challenge for us in Ghana and probably in Africa is that um, there's always an issue of trust. Uh, one thing, one person believes that the other one is not being forthright with him. And as a result of that, he cannot give all the information to him and all of that. And because of experience and our belief systems and all that, we don't tend to trust each other. And that's a challenge. But I think that there are so many good people out there who have good hearts, very kind hearts, who are in a, pos in a position to be able to partner or support organizations to be able to grow. One personal experience I had was that in some of the discussions I've had with some uh, possible financiers, they wanted to take more than 50% of the share. That means they want to control the organization. If you do not believe in your product and you do not believe in what you're doing, and it's all about making money for the business, probably you may just let the vision go. But what happens is that when you lose control of the vision, then in that case, you're not going to be able to uh, get that uh, fulfillment that comes with the uh, benefits that people derive from or the value that you're able to provide people from, for people. Now, with, with no practical experience, when I was going to learn, when I was uh, going to start the pig breed, one of the things that I did was I went to volunteer at the Nungwa Farms, which unfortunately is gradually um, fading off. The Nungwa Farms is or was supposed to be the authority in Ghana when it comes to uh, pig or, uh, yes, pig farming. So anybody at all who, or even those who are in Pong Tamarin, all, all others, used to get support as well from Nungwa Farms. But unfortunately, it's going down. So one of the things I'll suggest to you is that identify an organization, identify a farm that you'd be able to probably uh, support with, go there, learn out, out for some time, and then build up from there. If you do not have the opportunity, but you have the opportunity to be able to start um, a farm or to start engaging a form of agribusiness on your own, what I would advise you to do is to start small. Because I have a friend who started with 157 pigs in the eastern region. After four years, he had 35. So that just tells you that he probably didn't understand the fact that the pigs farrow at, at least twice uh, a year. And with all of 100 sows, had so, so much, was not able to provide uh, the housing, was not able to feed them. And they were just losing, going away like that. You know, so I, what I'd advise is that start small and build up on it, build the experience. And look, don't, one of the things that is a bane to us as well is that we love to do comparisons. Oh, this one is doing A, B, C, D. So I think I can also do it and surpass him. No, go at your own pace. Don't let people put pressure on you. So don't pressure yourself as well so that you can move, move, move uh, uh, on. Um, practical experience and interest, okay, that's for them. And then anybody at all who wants to start with the uh, export business, my advice or would be that is that get the requirements from whoever you're going to buy it from. So get your market first before you do your production so that whatever you produce fits into the market. In some instances, you are able to identify, uh, you're able to produce and you have your chance to have a market. That is fantastic. But in, from experience, it is always better that you, you get your market, get to know what exactly their requirements are. So for instance, if, I, if you're buying, let's say, share butter and you're looking at the moisture content, amongst other things, you should be able to ensure that some of these, uh, you're, you're able to build up on it. And whatever production, is being done is based on the requirements, and uh, once you submit, you want to deliver it to be accepted. One of I, I, one key thing is that uh, in starting an agri business as well, one of the things that you realize is that we don't do much in terms of reco uh, uh, recording documentation. So, for instance, you you are you are a lot of us don't even know how much it costs to be able to pro pro feed, for instance, our livestock to get to the stage whereby they are ready for market or for the table. And that is a challenge for a lot of agribusinesses. So if there's any skill at all that I'd want to encourage you to, to learn and to be consistent with, it is the part where you have to be able to ensure that whatsoever you do is documented. 
I, for one, I love, I love writing. So every time I have the opportunity to write, even when I go to bed, I, I have a pen and a notepad by me. And that's because my process of ideation starts even while, when I'm about going to bed, I sleep over it, I ponder over it, and then I jot them down. So probably that's uh, uh, something that we can also start. Just get a pen and a paper every time. Just whatever ideas come up, you can write them down. So that as you go along, documentation for you doesn't become too much of a challenge. Now, and that is why sometimes it's difficult for some of us to be able to sell our products. Why? Because we are not looking at the cost of our production. Got into the tail end, and uh, we would like to use this opportunity to acknowledge our sponsors, the key partner for this uh, webinar, uh, GIZ's Ghana office. Um, I think uh, Mr. Christoph is here. We would like to, to take a word or two from him then we'll be able to wrap up for, for, for today's section. Mr. Christoph, if we're here, GIZ, a word or two from you will be much appreciated. Um, good afternoon, sorry. Um, I think Christoph is off. Okay. Um, my name is Judah Niyama, and I'm from the Governance for Inclusive Development Program of GIZ Ghana, and we are... Um, this um, webinar um, is very important and it's coming timely and it's very strategic, especially with the individuals or the speakers that have been chosen. And we'd like to give a thumbs up um, to the Chamber of Agribusiness for organizing this particular webinar. And again, um, I would like to thank all the participants who have um, stayed with us till this time. I think it has gone through to um, about four hours and I'd like to thank us all. Um, my take or what I would say from my end, especially from the Governance for Inclusive Development Program, where we have a component by name Agriculture Business Dialogue, is, is that this um, webinar would improve and give, has given us insights as to how the COVID-19, especially um, this pandemic that caught not just governments by surprise, but also caught businesses by surprise, of which especially the informal businesses were caught by surprise and did not have any, they were um, all jittering and didn't know exactly how to reshape themselves and re reform themselves to suit this pandemic um, has been hit hard. And in, in our program, we are also looking at how best we can reshape ourselves to form policies and to help in our technical expertise that will suit and help um, Ghana shape and bring us back to it, our upward trajectory. So yes, as GIZ, we, we are opened global for collaborations in this manner and we've engaged the Chamber of Agribusiness and we will continue to engage them where necessary. So thank you so much for the Chamber of Agribusiness for coming up with this initiative and we are open for such um, um, collaborations and we, we all would are up together to bring Ghana back to the upper tra trajectory, even though Professor Bokpin um, indicated that it may take two or three years for Ghana to recover again. We hope that collaboratively we would work together to um, fasten and hasten this process that it will not take two to three years, but it will even take a year. We know it is ambitious, but collaboratively and working together, we will be able to do it. Thank you very much. One of the things I just wanted to say, I'll say in conclusion is that um, when it comes to market linkages, like the platforms that we have, um, it provides us an opportunity. But if you have soya beans and you have maize, livestock farmers are one of your very uh, ready markets. Go to schools, go to hotels, go to them, find out how they like, they need it. And then they'll be able to um, provide you a ready market. Um, uh, on, on that note, I'd like to say a very big thank you to the Chamber of Agri Business and for the opportunity to be able to share um, some of these thoughts and experiences that we have had as a, a company, Agriculture and More Limited. And we look forward to engaging further to uh, make uh, Ghana agribusiness rise to the pedestal that we are all expecting it to be at. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of, of the organizing committee and the chamber, I would like to thank you all, especially our facilitators, uh, Professor Bob King, uh, Mr. Anyaku, 
Mr. Naleban and Mr. Mr. Fectus Mela. We are most grateful. We say thank you for, for the time and thank you for availing yourself for these four sections. And to you all our participants for more works of life where we had a number of the participants who are outside Liberia. I could see Liberia here, I could see Syria here, Spain was here, Germany was here, and another colleague from China. We are grateful for your participation. Thank you very much. Without you, you wouldn't have been successful. We'd like to finally invite the CEO, Anthony, to give his final closing remarks and, and officially close us for today. So, Tony, if we are here, over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I want to say a big, big, big thank you to all participants uh, and also the speakers, especially the participants. Without them, um, the speakers wouldn't have been speaking to anyone. So I want to appreciate them uh, very much for taking their time to listen to our uh, speakers and uh, to take home and also to share their concerns with us. Uh, yes, it's been a fantastic project. And uh, let me say um, another appreciation to GIZ. Um, they'll be very fantastic and supportive along the line. Uh, GIZ MWAP. Uh, we are with uh, Dr. Elka and uh, Mr. Christoph, uh, very fantastic uh, in guiding us to get this off the ground. Uh, we hope to have much of this collaboration with them and partnership to deepen the agribusiness space. Um, yes, Prof made very uh, strategic statements that I think that um, we need to address certain things with regards to the agribusiness. First of all, I must say that, yes, the COVID has been a disruptive effect on the value chain and the supply chain. Uh, there is a need for us to look at the long-term agriculture or agribusiness policy, which affects the private sector investment area. Uh, without this, we may not be uh, working very well uh, in pushing ahead with uh, investment. Uh, Prof also made mention of um, that Ghana is not a service economy, which I also agree with him. We are production economy, and if that gives the impetus or the need for government to make some uh, production policies. And uh, while we continue to do production policies, that must be linked up to the marketing policies to drive the generality of the value chain. Uh, we also heard him speak about the fact that um, th there is no direct link to improve livelihoods, you know, we need to talk uh, talk more about this. FAO have been speaking about agriculture social intervention mechanisms. Okay, we do not have it as a country. Uh, whether economic uh, interventions, whether social interventions, there is the need for an agricultural intervention. Okay, what interventions are we doing for, especially the rural agriculture sector, to be more economically and socially independent and robust? So that is, and this COVID actually serves as the opportunity to do that. There is also the need for an increased uh, atmosphere of uh, regulatory investment, uh, which otherwise will also boost uh, the lending area for the agribusiness sector. To that end, we heard uh, Mr. Andrews speaking about the fact that there'll be a need for a whole operational area with regards to the investment sector, lending rate, um, how we, we should also probably work very well with the investment sector, the banking, the financial sector, to be able to model very specific lending or investment uh, models or alternative financing. So I think that uh, the chamber have a lot to do uh, with uh, the kind of recommendations that is coming from them. Our other two speakers of uh, FETIS and uh, Naliban have spoken very well of experience across the value chain looking at the logistics, the equipment level, and for him to also travel from here to South Africa and be looking for equipment for cashew, that tells us that there is a huge opportunity for agriculture machinery uh, productivity in Ghana. Those interested in investing into manufacturing, there are a lot of companies in Ghana that have the capacity, but otherwise do not have the financial powers to be able to do that. So it gives a lot of impetus. Yes. Uh, Naliban spoke about the need for us to harness the value chain and increase our market viability. 
uh, logistically, we had problems uh, with the supply chain, which he comes across as uh, an expert on. So uh, on this note, I want to say thank you for all that uh, expose and the recommendation. I must, I must add that the chamber on its own is working in a number of areas that I think members and the participants will be very happy to hear. Uh, we are about to launch what we call the Ghana uh, Agriculture Resilience Fund, which uh, goes in to support things of this nature with regards to the pandemic and other challenges that may come with regards to future happiness. We are also working to launch what we call the Ghana Ag Agribusiness uh, Cooperative Credit Union. Um, everything is almost ready, and I think that very soon the announcement will be made. Um, the coordinator, who himself is the director of policy, Dr. Uh, Kwejo, and his team are working on the Ghana Agribusiness Investment Compendium. So, to a large extent, the chamber is working on a number of areas that uh, I think will, will help in the in driving the alternative financing and investment into the various value chain uh, activities. One thing I picked from one person, uh, I, I'm not quite sure the, the name, but she, she was of the view that a Ghana Agribusiness Investment Fund could be very critical. Yes, we have been working on uh, Ghana uh, Agriculture Development Fund for some time now. Uh, that was supposed to encapsulate the investment criteria. But this is another opportunity for us to look at. For the past two years, we've been meeting the presidency and the Ministry of Finance to drive home the need for this fund. So we, we will go back to the drawing board. We wish to um, acknowledge the role that every one of you have played in getting this done, especially the committee that have worked on this, Bernard and the Adam and his group. Um, and also the chamber administrator, Nana Poku. We appreciate you all. And um, Doc, over to you. Thank you very much and I appreciate it. Good afternoon. Thank you once again to our participant. So lastly, before we go, we would like you to pay close attention to your inbox. We'll be sending you the details of the program after, after this afternoon. I uh, will be sending you the recordings. We'll be sending you uh, other documentations in terms of the PPT and the materials that were used in this section. We'll also be pleading with you to help us evaluate this section to help us improve subsequent sections in the form of an evaluation survey, as we'll send a link to your inbox as well. Please endeavor to help us evaluate and be very objective and critical as much as you can. It helps us. We, we, are not, we are not averse to criticism. It helps us to be able to improve. So as much as possible, we we'll need you to evaluate the webinar and make suggestions and recommendations that will help us to improve subsequent section. I would like to also use the opportunity to especially thank my team. Uh, Bernard, you've been very fantastic. Uh, Nana Pukui, if I hear, thank you very much. Uh, Enable, Ebenezer, thank you very much. And to all who have participated, and all who have provided you know, assistance in one form or the other, we are most grateful. And we'd like to uh, um, officially close here and expect our, our messages in your inboxes very soon. Thank you very much and have a nice afternoon and a good lunch. Thank you.